Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Tech. And that, of course, means some smart talk radio is in your future. And this segment is no exception. We're going to be talking about a subject of which we have talked before, but maybe with no one more an expert on George Washington and our nation's highest office than uh, Harlow Unger. He is a former distinguished visiting fellow in American history at Mount Vernon. He's also the author of more than 20 books, including The Last Founding Father, Lion of Liberty, American Tempest, and John Quincy Adams. He resides in New York City, but he is clearly worldly. Mr. Unger, how are you, my friend? Just fine, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on your show. Well, we're very happy to have you here. George Washington, my gosh, who's been talked about more and written about more, but I know you have a very interesting take. You have a brand new workout called Mr. President, George Washington and the Making of the Nation's Highest Office. Let's start with this. And maybe it's obvious, but why George Washington for you of all people? Well, I've written several books on Washington, one on his private life called The Unexpected George Washington. Uh, and this one is really uh, less, well, it's about Washington, of course, but it's about the presidency itself and how he created it. Uh, people haven't, historians haven't really looked at that. Uh, the Constitution says the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States, but it fails to define executive power and fail to say what the president should do with it other than execute the office of the president, whatever that means. Uh, it meant, means nothing, and that's exactly what the framers intended. The president was to do nothing. Uh, and he was to be a figurehead. Uh, the president, uh, uh, the Constitution ordered the president to take care that the laws be executed, but it gave him no law enforcement arm or powers. So when Washington took office, he really had no powers under the Constitution, and that's exactly what the framers intended. Yet today, scholars call the presidency the imperial presidency. He has as much power in many instances as an emperor. And how did this come about? Well, it was Washington who created this office. Uh, he he uh, took control of the presidency when Congress was out of session to meet uh, emergency needs. Uh, the first thing that happened was uh, Congress adjourned, the first, very first Congress adjourned uh, without leaving him any money to run the government. So the government shut down, if you can imagine that ever happening. Uh, <laughs> okay. so, uh, so Washington uh, uh, just took matter, took the law into his own hands. He sent his Treasury Secretary uh, to private banks in New York and borrowed the money. Uh, he doesn't have the right to do that uh, under the Constitution. Only Congress can uh, uh, appropriate funds and spend money. Uh, Washington did it because he had to keep the government running. He refused to let Congress shut it down. Similarly, uh, the Indians, uh, they, and they were con considered foreign nations in those days, the Indians in the West attacked uh, American settlers in Ohio. Uh, again, Congress was out of session. Washington... Uh, refused to sit, stand by, and do nothing while uh, his, his fellow citizens were attacked uh, by foreign troops. Uh, so he drafted uh, a small army, sent General Mad Anthony Wayne out to Ohio uh, to fight uh, a war with the Indians. So, in effect, he declared war. And the Constitution says that only Congress can declare war. The president has no right to do so. Uh, yet he set a precedent uh, of, of the more than uh, one dozen wars that we have fought uh, since uh, the uh, beginnings of our nation. Uh, presidents have, uh, the Congress has declared war only five times. The presidents uh, have taken us to war on their own initiative uh, all these other times and, and have have really taken us to war at various uh, so-called black ops and, and, uh, and, and not really wars, uh, uh, defensive actions, so-called, in, in other nations. But the presidents don't have the right to do so. Do you, uh, again, it, the way you're describing this is, and America has been in many forks in the road, but the, the war is over, the Constitution has been written, ratified, George Washington himself finds himself as the president of the United States with sort of the modeling clay, so to speak, of the office. And in essence, 
in some ways, the future of the country. Had it not been Washington, had it been Jefferson or Adams or Ben Franklin, for that matter, in your opinion, do you believe that the presidency might have evolved down a completely different path? Oh, absolutely. It would have remained. It would have remained uh, a, a, a figurehead. Uh, the Constitution was written that way. The Constitution uh, begins, the first words of the Constitution, is, we the people. Uh, and the Constitution gave more, more power uh, to the House of Representatives, which at the time was the only directly elected uh, federal body uh, directly elected by the people. And the House of Representatives was given the most power. Uh, as James Madison, who helped write the Constitution, put it, uh, in our government, and these are Madison's words, in our government, the executive department is not the stronger branch of the system, but the weaker. That's what Madison said, and that's what the framers uh, believed. Uh, but Washington uh, saw, as, he, as, as his time in office progressed, he saw that he simply could not uh, fulfill his oath of office to uh, protect, defend, preserve, protect, and defend uh, the Constitution without violating the letter of the Constitution to preserve its spirit. Uh, so that uh, he took, as I said, he borrowed money when Congress was out of session, didn't have the right to do so, went to war without con congressional consent when Congress was uh, out of office, and continued to do so uh, at, at one point. Uh, we were threatened with uh, rioting, uh, uh, in, incited by uh, the French government, which uh, the French Revolution was underway and had turned ugly. And uh, the French ambassador here uh, was fo trying to foment uh, French revo uh, French-style revolution in the United States to get the United States to fight uh, in uh, alongside France against England. And uh, Washington issued a, uh, a neutrality proclamation, a proclamation with the force of law, which uh, prohibited Americans from taking part uh, in uh, these riots or partic participating in any way in the war between France and England. The president has absolutely no right to issue a proclamation, a proclamation or executive order, as we call most of them, uh, have the force of law. Well, the president doesn't have the right to, to write a law. Uh, only, that's why Congress is called a legislature. Only Congress can issue a law. But uh, Washington issued eight executive orders with the force of law uh, without any congressional consent. And since then, because of his, his precedent, uh, presidents have issued more than 13,500 executive orders. In other words, they have unilaterally uh, imposed laws on the United States. Congress has only passed 20,000 laws. The pre presidents have issued uh, more than 13,500 executive orders with the force of law. So basically so what you have is you have in George Washington a president that is, not, is in essence creating the scope and dimension of the office and therefore telling all of his, those that would follow, <laughs> do what you want. Exactly. Well, he knew he was setting a precedent yeah. uh, in everything he did. And it's not that they uh, did anything they wanted to. What they did was they just simply cited the father of our country. Well, if Washington did it, uh, so can I. Uh, that's where he, he created the presidency. And uh, so, so really, it wasn't the Constitution that created the imperial presidency. Uh, today, it was it was George Washington. Uh, one of the one of the uh, 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 Washington created what I call in my book, Mr. President. Uh, I call them seven pillars of executive power, and uh, those pillars of power. Uh, really changed uh, the complexion of the presidency and made it more than an equal branch of government, but at times, depending on the individual president, at times uh, the most powerful of the three branches of government. 
but he wasn't the only one to uh, seize powers uh, or assume powers is a better word assume powers that weren't grant- given to him in the constitution uh, congress has often assumed powers that didn't belong to the congress and passed unconstitutional laws uh, and uh, at times the supreme court has gone beyond its uh, constitutional prerogatives as a uh, uh, an appellate court and issued decisions that essentially have the same uh, uh, amount to legislation and that is not the role of the Supreme Court. Uh, it cannot legislate. It can simply hear uh, uh, appeals and review the constitutionality of various laws. Uh, but one of the great precedents that uh, Washington seized, Washington had no law enforcement powers really under the Constitution uh, but when uh, a, a group of farmers, a large group of farmers in western Pennsylvania refused to pay their uh, federal taxes, he uh, raised uh, uh, 13,500 troops and sent them out to enforce the law and for, to enforce the tax laws. Ironically, uh, 30 years before, he had led the tax protests against England, and now he was suppressing. Uh, tax protests by his fellow citizens. Uh, but uh, as he put it, uh, uh, a minority, uh, he was not uh, about to allow a minority uh, to dictate to the majority. Uh, he said, if the minority, and these are his words, if the minority are suffered to dictate to the majority, there can be no security for life, liberty, or property. Uh, so again, he ignored the letter of the Constitution. Uh, to enforce the spirit. And he set a precedent for future presidents, uh, as uh, some of uh, your listeners may remember. In 1957, Dwight D. Eisenhower sent troops uh, into uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, to put down, uh, to enforce a Supreme Court decision uh, that uh, uh, mandated uh, equal education, equal access to education in the schools of Little Rock, and allow black children to attend schools with white children. Uh, So in doing so, uh, this was another pillar of power uh, over law enforcement. Uh, And he, without congressional consent, sent troops to enforce federal law. If you just joined us, here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck of Lewis at Large Radio. We're in the midst of some smart talk radio with uh, one who would know, Harlow Unger. He's former Distinguished Visiting Fellow in American History at Mount Vernon. Also, you know him for his work, uh, the extraordinary work, John Quincy Adam, uh, amongst others. He is a broadcaster, educator, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking specifically today uh, about a new work called Mr. President, George Washington and the making of the nation's highest office. <sighs> Let me ask you this question. Uh, we have... Washington uh, carving out a place for himself, uh, what he felt, obviously, out of necessity. Over the years, what efforts has Congress done to either tackle them, so to speak? Or are they going along willingly, or, or, or what's their attitude about this? And why are they not attempting to, so to speak, put the president back in a box again? Well, they have at times. Uh, A lot depends on the personalities of the president, on the one hand, of the Speaker of the House of Representatives, on the other hand, uh, on the majority leader of the Senate, and uh, the the justices of the Supreme Court. But there has been a constant struggle in the history, uh, over the uh, history of our nation, a constant struggle for power between the three branches of government. And when we've had strong presidents, strong personalities as president, they have tended to uh, to walk all over Congress. Uh, Jefferson control, and especially if you have the same political party in in Congress as you have in the presidency, uh, it gives the president more power. And if he has a strong personality, he uses that power to just dictate. Uh, to the Congress. Uh, We had that uh, under Jefferson. Jefferson uh, just told Congress what to do, and they they did it. They they were like lapdogs. We had uh, the same similar situation, and and it it, it did not work in the best interests of our nation at the time of Jefferson. Jefferson imposed a trade embargo that cut us off from all foreign trade, Uh, and and in many respects because of that, his term in office was one of the worst presidential terms in in American history. 
uh, a similar situation occurred in the 30s when uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Congress were the same party, and the president really dictated to Congress uh, what laws he wanted passed, and they did so. But uh, now uh, we have the opposite, as, as we all know, uh, the president, President Obama is a Democrat, and we have a Republican majority in the House of Representatives. Uh, so uh, the, the president can get very, very little done. Congress really dictates what is or is not done. When Washington was, uh, when Washington came into power, well, or into the office, let's just say the office, do you believe that, is there evidence that there were those that expected him to take the reins the way he did? Or was this a complete surprise? This was a complete surprise. Uh, the Constitutional Convention, they had spent four months uh, writing the Constitution, and no one expected the president uh, to assume these powers. That's why the Constitution was written the way it was. It was written, we the people of the United States. And that meant the House of Representatives, because in those days, the Senate was not uh, directly elected by the people. Uh, it was elected, each, the, two, the two senators from each state were appointed by the state legislature. So they were not elected by the people. The president was not elected by the people. He was elected by the Electoral College. The House of Representatives, each member of the House of Representatives, was elected directly by the people of the district in which he lived. And the Constitution thus gave we the people uh, uh, most power. No, uh, the, the, the Congress could override a, a presidential veto of a bill, but no one can override uh, a veto by the, the Speaker of the House. A law cannot become a law without the signature of the Speaker of the House. It can become a law without the, without the signature of the President. Uh, they, only the House of Representatives can uh, appropriate funds, can pass tax laws, initiate or pass tax laws. Uh, the Senate has no power over money except to ratify what the House does, but the House has all uh, control of the purse strings. Uh, the uh, House of Representatives is the grand jury of the United States. The only the House can impeach or indict uh, a president, uh, a, a member of the Senate, uh, a member of the House, or any judge, including the, the chief justices of the Supreme Court. So this power of impeachment uh, by the House of Representatives, again, we the people, is a, a supreme power. Well, I believe it was John Adams that said the vice presidency, by contrast, was the most insignificant office ever contrived or something uh, close to that. Interesting contrast. Is that just because there's just not enough room in Washington for a Congress, a vice president, and a president to all be flailing their uh, elbows around or uh, share the contrast there? No, uh, it was, uh, again, it has to do with uh, keeping the executive power uh, next uh, next to nothing. It, it has to do with creating a figurehead. Uh, having created a figurehead as president, well, they needed somebody. To, what happens if the figurehead dies? We need another figurehead. Uh, so they said, well, let's uh, elect a vice president to serve a, f a figurehead. Uh, well, we can't have two figures, we've got to give him something to do. So they said, well, he shall preside, uh, let him preside over the Senate. So he was a uh, presiding officer in the Senate, which gave him a little bit of work to do. He had to go and, and be kind of a moderator in the Senate every day, but he couldn't vote uh, and, and had no power. Uh, the, the only time he could vote is in the event of a tie, uh, which was uh, quite rare. Uh, they assumed it would be quite rare. Uh, but uh, so that's all the, the, the vice president's job basically was to sit and wait for the president to die. And uh, by presiding over the Senate, it gave, gave him a little work to do every day. The, uh, a, a funny thing happened uh, when uh, President Washington, uh, under the advise and consent rule uh, governing foreign treaties, when Washington went to the Senate uh, to uh, get the advice and consent of the Senate for a, a draft of a foreign treaty. Uh, well, he went when he walked in the Senate. Uh, he is addressed as Mr. President at that time, uh, but so is the presiding officer of the Senate. 
John Adams, who was the vice president. So here we were in a situation where both men were to be addressed as Mr. President, and Washington was not about to address his vice president as Mr. President, so he walked out. (laughs) And since then, no president has ever set foot in the Senate uh, since since that time, the pres- when the president wants to speak to Congress, uh, he addre- go- addresses a joint session of Congress in the House of Representatives, where the presiding officer is addressed as Mr. Speaker, and only the president of the United States is addressed as Mr. President. <laughs> so that's a cur- that, that's the reason uh, the presidents uh, go into uh, joint sessions of Congress. Well, we got that straight. That's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, and we're starting to wind down here, unfortunately. But let, let's, from your perspective as a historian, from your perspective uh, just as, as an American citizen, what did Washington do the right thing, in essence, forming this by himself? The, the presidency, again, is thought of as a piece of modeling clay. He molded it. Do you think it was done? It, was it proper to do it all over again? Was the Constitution, should it, should it have been written differently to give the president more power? And how, I guess, in, in an overriding question, my gosh, we're all so used to a president with a fair amount of power here. I'm trying to imagine one that's simply a figurehead, and how that would have bowed for us or in, in today's world. Well, it would have been like England, uh, where the president has very little power, uh, or where the king has very little power, but that's exactly what we were trying to avoid. avoid. No, this was a unique constitution. They did the best they, the, the framers did the best they could, because uh, they had to compromise. Uh, we had, the, the interests of the, of the South uh, were not the same as the North. And to unite the com- the, those 13 colonies, uh, those 13 independent states at that time, into one united nation, uh, the, they, they, they did the best they could with the Constitution. And each of the three branches of government has asserted and assumed powers not granted uh, by the Constitution itself. As for Washington and the presidency, the, the office that he created, uh, there's no question uh, he was the, the greatest president in American history. Uh, he was the greatest patriot in American history. Uh, he loved this country. He could have been dictator at any time. He could have uh, he could have been become a dictator, military dictator during the Revolutionary War. He refused to do that. He did not want to become president. He did so uh, against his his personal. He sacrificed his personal interests uh, to do so. Uh, very few of our presidents uh, have not sought the office. Uh, Washington did not seek the office, and uh, there's no question uh, he was the most uh, disinterested, most patriotic, uh, most uh, selfless uh, president in American history. And every person who considers seeking the presidency today should study uh, uh, his presidency. It's unfortunate that very few do. Uh, I think the, 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 uh, one of the few men who uh, reluctantly ran for presidency uh, after Washington was probably uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who had the same background, uh, military background, and uh, a great patriot uh, who sacrificed uh, his, uh, his, really his, his fortune uh, for, to serve the country. Uh, remember the signers of the Declaration of Independence ended that document by saying, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Well, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote those words, never uh, ran home to Monticello to, uh, as far from the war as he possibly <laughs> could and never fired a shot during the war. Yeah. Uh, uh, Washington went off to war and led the war and at times was on, on horseback and galloping right into the thick of battle. Uh, he was not afraid to fight for this country. He loved this country. And uh, in my mind, uh, was certainly the greatest president in our history. Well, well said. Our guest has been veteran journalist, broadcaster, and educator, Harlow Unger. He has written an extraordinary work called Mr. President, George Washington, and the Making of the Nation's Highest Office. George Washington, a fascinating subject, especially when it's combined with his 
uh, relationship with the presidency and defining it for what it is for us today. Tell us, I, I'm, we probably know this, but uh, tell us how we can get a copy of the book and also how they can find out more about the work you do. Uh, well, I have a website, uh, harlowunger.com, uh, uh, com, and uh, they can get the book uh, either at at bookstores, uh, Barnes and Noble, any any major bookstore, or, my, or any bookstore, or you can get it uh, uh, at uh, over the internet at, uh, at Amazon dot com, Barnes and Noble dot com, and uh, you, you just pull it up on the internet, uh, put and and you can get it by mail. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to your next work, and I do appreciate it. Have a wonderful year. Well, thank you. The same to you. Thank you again for inviting me. It's an honor to be on your show. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.